Welcome to the Sunwall Podcast, where we interview the stars of e-commerce. Cool. Uh, welcome to the Sunwall Podcast. Today we have Alejandro Moreno, who runs uh, the e-commerce of Get More, a premier Shopify plus agency. So welcome, Alejandro. So maybe first question is maybe you can uh, give a little backstory, background about yourself um, and uh, get more and how you got involved there. Absolutely, Rohan. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here with you and your listeners. So hopefully we can share uh, our experience and create some value to the people. Yeah, so my name is Alejandro. I, I am part from the founding team of Get More. It's a Shopify Plus agency. We are based in Mexico City. And we mainly work for e-commerce brand in the D2C space, especially with the skincare and apparel, like skincare and beauty, fashion and apparel, and food and beverage industries. So yeah, that's like our bread and butter from every day. Uh, makes sense. So maybe just getting started with Get More, maybe you can talk about a couple clients or specific customers that you've worked with before. Yeah, as I mentioned, like we we. Sp- Specialize and we focus on the design and development of Shopify Plus stores, mainly from the industries that I, that I said. And we normally work with either the founding team or the director of the e-commerce, like e-commerce managers, CMOs, and all the people involved in the e-commerce e-commerce team. And we have different types of clients in terms of size. We have the the small companies the medium companies and also some enterprise like the topperware unilever and all of those big big brands totally makes sense you kind of across this tag but more focused shopify plus kind of some of these kind of bigger type brands there so i know one of the things you do is helping with website design um so maybe kind of a couple questions here one is what are some common gotchas people do when in their existing websites and then to an overall framework you have uh, to help people make their websites better. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. So all of our projects, they go through the same process and it's a five-step process. The first stage is the strategy. When we do a benchmark, we analyze their current website, the current store or what they are trying to achieve. We ask to our clients a bunch of different questions in terms of goals, in terms of the team, in terms of the value proposition of the product, et cetera, et cetera. So once we we do the strategy phase, then we move to a design phase where we, all of our designs are done in Figma and we design for for mobile, for desktop and for tablets. So we do different uh, device versions of each of the different pages and we share all of those designs with the clients. So it is a very uh, teamwork and very iterative process where we need a lot of input from the client. And also we we implement all of the best practices that we have seen with other customers. Then once the client approves every single page of the website, then we move to a development phase where we do all of the different uh, development for the pages. We, we work in terms of development. We work with tools like GitHub, where we share uh, all of the different versions of the website. And then once the development process is done, then we move to a quality assurance phase. Where we have a team and they, they take care of testing the, the store in any device and every browser. Like we mainly focus in, in Chrome and in, in Safari, and we focus on mobile, tablet, and desktop. But like they do like a technical test and also functionality test and visual test as well. So then once the quality assurance process is done, then we move to the launch phase where we train the client on how to operate the stores, how to improve their processes and everything related to the e-commerce stores. And then we set the launch date so they can open the store to the public. Totally makes sense. Really great answer there. I just wanted to dig in. So it seems like you guys are using really cutting edge tools such as GitHub, Figma. Are there any other types of tools that you guys uh, recommend in kind of the website design process or those are kind of main tools? We use some other tools. Like in terms of internal communication, everything happens through Slack, like most of the tech companies. In terms of design, we mainly use Notion, Figma, and we use Notion for 
project management for project and task management. We use Notion. Uh, for development, we use Figma. And right now we are playing around with some AI tools about code reviews and, and different, uh, like with Copilot and those kind of fun uh, tools that are out there now. And in terms of QAs, we use browser stack. So we make sure that everything works smoothly. And in, as a general tool, some team members use Zapier for automation. Uh, some others use Make for, for also for automation. And, and we love to be playing around with different uh, Shopify apps from the App Store because like we there are like a bunch of different things that could be done and add value to our customers. So that is why we are su we are super lean on, on moving into that uh, like specific training every day. Uh, it totally makes sense. Uh, what I found funny is I actually use uh, as a software engineer previously by training a lot of these tools myself. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool to see. I think I use Notion, Figma, mm -hmm. Slack, GitHub, Copilot. So it's uh, really cool to see an overlap on the tools. I think two things I really wanted to, to reemphasize here, and I think you've mentioned this, is that use some browser stack to make sure it looks on all types of good on all types of screen, tablets, mobile, desktop, and you really design for each of the three uh, different screens. Maybe you can talk about, so when you're designing the sites, what do you do on the mobile site versus of the desktop site? That's a super good and important question. So most of the agencies or even like most of the themes that are pre-built for Shopify, most of them, they are responsive in terms of visual, right? So visually, they are totally responsive. Experience-wise, not all of them are responsive. A really good example is the product page. So the product page on an online store is the most important page for conversions, right? So the home page is, the, is for engage the user and the product page is to convert a visitor into a sale. So the product page, like in mobile, should have a slightly different layout, and especially above the fold, and we call we use that term like above the fold, is that everything that you can see before you start scrolling. So above the fold should be the most important elements, like title, price, image, variant, trust signifiers and add to car bottom. So they need to be there, even though, even if like in a desktop version, those elements are, are showed a little different. Maybe on desktop, you are showing quantity next to the size uh, chart. Maybe on mobile, quantity is not that important. So you are getting rid of that, right? Because those kind of things, if you do a responsive, like visual responsive, where you just like arrange the elements by the grid, you align them vertically, instead of creating a different experience, your conversion rate will be affected there. And it's super common and super common that on mobile, you have three times more visits, but, the, but that doesn't mean that people are buying on mobile even though they are visiting there. So there is a big gap, a big opportunity for most of the D2C brands. That totally makes sense. So I think just rehashing, because I think this is a really important point. Um, instead, like a lot of people, they just take their desktop design and making it for mobile just means that all the buttons fit on the screen for mobile and that it's responsive. Mm -hmm. But on mobile, you have less space. So you need to actually rethink the design. And I think you mentioned like mm -hmm. stuff like quantity and stuff. Maybe on mobile, you don't have them as much space, so maybe you remove those things. So really thinking about how you design the page uh, on mobile for the limited space. And I think you mentioned that you do get a lot more traffic there, but the conversion rate is low, lower. Um, so you really have to make sure you design it in a, a great manner. Um, so yeah, just... exactly. Also, another example would be the, the product images, right? So the product image on desktop, you could have a big image and then you have like thumbnails, even either from one of the sides, left or right, or below uh, the product image. But on mobile, you shouldn't have like a product uh, th thumbnails for the different, uh, different images. Maybe it will be just like a slider to see the different images, right? So if you do that, you're gonna get rid 
to a bunch of space so you can compact everything and see the most important element in, in a bubble default. Oh, it totally makes sense. So I think what Alejandro just reemphasizing his point is that uh, sometimes you have uh, image thumbnails on the left or something or on the bottom, but on mobile, you don't have that space. So making a carousel view, um, I really uh, save that space. Really good example there, Alejandro. So when you're designing these, do you guys use the native Shopify themes to implement it? Do you guys hard code user, like use a different web framework or do you use one of these tools? Like how do you guys actually serve the website? Well, that's a very interesting question, Rohan. <laughs> it has changed across the years because the last couple of years we were focusing on custom stores and custom theme. So we were using like a framework and I don't know if you, how familiar you are with Shopify, but there used to be a framework called Slate and with Slate, you could build a custom theme by using Shopify's technology and Shopify's best practices. Uh, but now like they are like Slate is no longer available. It is available. It's no longer supported, but also all of the new themes from different companies, they are super well done. Right? Like most of them, they have been by uh, insanely. So now we are into a position where it really depends on the client's need, whether we use a pre-built theme or we build a custom theme for the client. It really depends on the size of the store. It really depends on the requirements. It really depends on the branding. If it's more like a commercial generic branding, then a pre-built theme is more than enough. If it's a niche, uh, like a brand, or it's a boutique brand where branding is one of the value propositions that we go with a custom theme. Totally makes sense. So really staying customer focused and identifying the requirements and bringing in the custom theme only when it's acquired. Um, yes, we don't try to push like either way. It really depends on the company on the client's requirements and also what is going to bring more value to them. Totally makes sense. Uh, on a similar vein, you, you said that sometimes you also, instead of building, rebuilding everything from scratch, you guys use uh, other Shopify apps to really make sure your customers have a good experience. Mm -hmm. Are there any Shopify apps you found um, particularly useful? Yes, we, we do have our stack of apps that we always use. And that's a very important topic because the merchants and the brand shouldn't, it's not like white or black, right? Like you shouldn't do everything hard coded or do everything through an app. It really depends on different factors like of the complexity of the functionality on how many technical resources is going to consume, the cost, the monthly cost for the app, et cetera, et cetera. So it really depends on whether you go with a custom solution or you go with an app that is already on the app store. So basically the, the most, the three the most common apps that we use and we recommend to our clients. The first one is Rebuy. It's an AI solution for customization and personalization of the stores. They have multiple features. One of them is they have a smart card. So whenever you add a product to the card, then you see like a flyout card from the right. And in there you, you can embed a, a widget that is like for cross sell. So depending on the product that you have on your cart, by does an analysis from all of your past orders and make a makes a recommendation of what is more likable for the consumer to add to cart. So that helps a lot to increase the AOV. So Riva is a great app that we use all the time. Also, we use Boostcomer for product and filter search. They are super robust and scalable solution for filters and for advanced search. They recently launched an AI solution for the collection. So the collection, the sorting of the collection is automated through all of the, of the behavior of each customer. So it's super, uh, super good. And we really recommend to use that. And the third one, we use Recharge for all of the stores that offer subscriptions. So Recharge is one of the best for, for subscription business model for online stores. Totally makes sense. So you guys use solutions for subscriptions, for search, and then add the card upsell. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, so backtracking. So we've talked about the website. I know one other thing you guys do is you guys really help in terms of email design. So are there any kind of frameworks you use there? 
Yes, we, we work with Klaviyo. I, I forgot to mention that app. We truly recommend implementing Facebook at Klaviyo, no matter what type of product or service you are selling. Klaviyo, like, creates so much, so many sales for the stores, as long as you are feeding Klaviyo with the right data. In Klaviyo, what we do is that we set up and design different flows. There are like, f especially five to seven, mo the most important ones. So we do the implementation, the setup, and the design of each of the, of the emails. And we follow the same process as, the, as, as before. First, we share a designing paper to the client that follows the best practices. And then we do the implementation in, in Klaviyo. Uh, Klaviyo is super robust. They recently launched an SMS feature. But in terms of mailing, it is like natively connected to Shopify. So all of the data that is going on Shopify automatically translates into Klaviyo. So you can do dynamic segments. You can automate different flows based on customer's behavior, right? So it is a great tool and every e-commerce brand should be using Klaviyo out there. Uh, totally makes sense. Uh, I think one thing you mentioned just diving in is it's really important to make sure you have the right data set up in Klaviyo. So maybe you can talk about maybe some common gotchas or how to set up Klaviyo correctly in terms of. Yeah, so Klaviyo, they have, whenever you install the app on Shopify, like Klaviyo takes to their, takes you to, to their, their dashboard where you need to create an account and then you can do a super simple and straightforward integration through their setup wizard, right? So you just follow four to five steps, right? And then everything is already set up. All of Amazing. the most common flows are already pre-built, but like then you need to adapt depending on your product, your industry and your ICP, right? So based on that, you need to adjust all of the flows, adjust the timelines, adjust the weight, time and like a bunch of different things that and we normally take care of for, for the client. Totally makes sense. Um, Clavio has the typical flows uh, set up out of the box, really integrates with Shopify, but then depending on your industry, uh, ICP, you know, what's your kind of brand story, um, you might have to adjust the email flows, duration, content there. Uh, cool. Uh, the next question I had is you work with a lot of brands. Uh, so are there any kind of brands, like just some common mistakes brands do that you've seen or the things they should be focusing more on? Absolutely. It depends on the stage of the online store and also of the maturity of the e-commerce management teams. But some of the most common mistakes is that people, some, some e-commerce managers believe that once the store is already up and running, then they just need to focus on driving traffic to the store, right? There are like a bunch of different things that you need to like keep digging in into the online store data per se. And, but like basically what we have seen that they, like the e-commerce managers don't track are the two most important metrics, right? The number one is the conversion rate. The number two is the AOV and the third one is the number of sessions that happen on the online store. And it's very interesting because like the conversion rate, which is the most important one, is divided by different stages, right? It's the, like the, the, the common name, it's called the funnel, the sales funnel. So first of all, you need to understand what is your add to cart rate, right? Like how many people out of 100 are adding products to their cart? Then how many of those people are moving into the checkout process? And then how many of those are making a sale or making a, a purchase, sorry. So it's common to be 50% every time you move forward, right? So if you have 10 people add to cart, then it's normal if you have five people reach checkout and then 2.5 as a conversion rate. Some e-commerce managers or some others, they focus just on the top revenue, right? Oh, we are not selling that much or we are selling a lot, but like they need to double click in each of the different metrics. And the conversion rate is one of the most important one and is divided by three different metrics as well, right? Once you have identified which is the metric that you need 
to optimize better, then you need to double click again and understand if you need to optimize it in desktop or mobile. It's normally on mobile because even though you are, if we talked about this earlier, like even though you're receiving more visits, you are not getting that many conversion, but like sometimes the difference is too big, right? Like desktop converts 10 times more as mobile. It should like a regular range should be between 40 to 50% more on desktop. If you are more than that, then you need to optimize your mobile version because something is rendered. And then once you have already nailed your conversion rate, then you need to move to your AOV, right? Try to sell more to the current clients, right? How can you implement different features? How can you do upsell? How could you implement a cross sell strategy? And then you can focus on the number of sessions. Uh, totally makes sense. I think that's a really good point. At least people I've talked to, it's all about, okay, I got my website set up. I got this new theme in. Okay, now I really need to focus on the Instagram ads or something like that, really getting the traffic. Because it's also really easy to do, right? You just put more money in it and you, exactly. you get more traffic. You can't really just put money in and conversion rate goes up. So that's a really good point there. And then I think really point here is that it's not just conversion rate. You want to break down conversion rate. Uh, think about where in the funnel they're dropping off. Think about mobile. Think about desktop. And really get into the details there. Uh, you can maximize the success of the store. Um, exactly. Awesome. Stepping back a little, what is your guys' focus for the next six months? Yeah. Yeah. So like for the next six months, we are trying to help our current customer base to increase their numbers. Basically, we like to create like long-term relationship with our clients. So we also do like a bunch of different new Shopify store every year. We normally do between 40 and 50 new stores per year. But like also we, we take care of the clients that have been in the past. We have clients working with us for the last six years. And month by month, we are helping them to increase their numbers and to achieve different results and to tackle the different challenges that they are having. Because some of the operational challenges or bottleneck for the e-commerce team could be solved through the online store or through the Shopify admin or through the Shopify app ecosystem, right? Like a bunch of, there are like a bunch of different things to automate process. Shopify has their own native Shopify flow app where you can automate a bunch of different uh, manual tasks. So some customers uh, come to us and, oh, I have this challenge, that challenge, and that challenge. And then we try to help them. We try to look for a workaround by using the Shopify ecosystem. Totally makes sense. So you guys have your existing customer base. You want to make sure they're successful. For example, the automations you mentioned with Shopify Flow, and then obviously onboarding new clients too. Um, so these are more, the next segment is kind of more general questions. Um, so first question here is, uh, any kind of differences you notice between commerce in Mexico versus other countries? Yes, absolutely. There is a big difference of consumer behavior between Mexico, US and Canada. So those are the three countries that we mostly work with. I would say like 50% of our clients are from Mexico, 40% are from the US and 10% are from Canada. And there are like different stages and the e-commerce as an industry is on a different stage in each country. Like US and Canada are very similar, but like Mexico is completely different. So Mexico is more in a premature stage where they need to trust that e-commerce is, is like that they can trust in the e-commerce model. COVID helped a lot, right? For obvious reasons. But even though like they, we are still some years behind. So what is working in the US right now, it's gonna work in Mexico in the next three to four years. So the consumer, like the maturity of the industry is like one or two levels below where, and we are on a stage where we need to convince the client we need to help like our clients and the brands to provide trust to their users and to their visitors and in the us and in canada we are more on the conversion optimization on the constant conversion optimization because like they have a bunch of traffic they already have some customers and it's like how can we add more value and how can we convert visits into sales 
right? Because as we said, bringing visits is super easy. You just put more money on Facebook and you have more visits. Like getting quality of those visits is different and then making those visits to buy is another story. Uh, totally makes sense there. So in Mexico, a couple years behind in terms of consumers being comfortable with e-commerce, but also just overall e-commerce maturity. And in markets such as the U.S., um, the consumers and the merchants are a little more mature. Um, so really focusing on conversion rate optimization there. Uh, and then, Correct. Um, and then just any overall trends in e-commerce, just very general question that you're kind of excited about or interested paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are like a bunch of different new tools that are AI driven. Shopify has launched different features into their own system. There is a AI tool to, to, to write the product description, right? So you just share like keywords and a general topic and then an AI tool writes a product description for our customers. So we, that is great. And we are partnered with different apps, as I mentioned. So Rebuy is doing a bunch of different efforts and they are working super hard in the, into the AI space. So I think we are super excited to see what is coming in the next couple of years in terms of AI and in terms of like all of the different SMS and email marketing strategy. They are evolving. They are changing. So we are excited about those trends right now. Totally makes sense. So I think a couple you mentioned are AI and product descriptions, upsells, email, and SMS marketing. Are there any areas that you would want to see AI in that you haven't heard about or you think needs to be a little more focused on? In terms of e-commerce, like we have seen some efforts for customer support, but I think that that space needs a lot of improvement and that will change the customer experience if once they, they reach a level where the customer support like where their AI customer support is at the same level as a human being. So that is going to change, like completely change the customer experience. That totally makes sense. Right now, whenever I have to go through one of those call trees or support, I'm always like talk to agent. That's the only thing I mentioned. Exactly. Um, but Me when too. It becomes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But when it becomes easier um, than talking to an agent, there's a point where it switches, then there'll be a huge breakthrough there. Um, and then just a final question here. Any kind of recent shopping experience you've had or any brand or just anything you shopped or saw online that you were really impressed with? Uh, I'm a super online shopper. So every, I buy everything online, like even the supermarket. But like I, I, I love running as well. So I, every time I need a new running shoes, I buy it from Nike. And also I recently bought a, a mattress online and it was great like in mexico we have this company that is like casper in the u.s so so we bought that one and like all the experience and everything was amazing because that's also something that is really important and it's not just the online experience also the offline experience and the post purchase experience because that's gonna be a huge difference because you have clients and you have people who are buying from you, but then you need to convert those into brand ambassadors, right? So they can refer to their friends, they can talk about your brand and that is gonna happen. And we're not experts in that, but that is gonna happen into the post purchase experience, right? So we always recommend to our clients to look for something innovative, for something creative, for something different to do in the, post purchase process in the fulfillment, in the delivery, in the, when asking for a review, when after X amount of months or after a year when they bought a product. So that's very important. There are some agencies that work especially on that specific niche. So I, I will truly recommend to, to reach out those kind of agencies to, to create a better experience in order to gain more brand ambassadors and not just customers. That makes sense. And I really want to put two points here. It's not about just delighting your existing customers, but really trying to convert them to brand ambassadors so you can get good reviews, or maybe they'll just directly invite your friends there. And two, I really like how you're kind of, usually sometimes people say, oh, we're the experts on everything, but really um, honing your kind of specialty and admitting um, the areas where you're not focusing as much.
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sun Mall Podcast. Please make sure to subscribe.